Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to give our registrants a couple more minutes to join, and then we will get started. So please hold on. Well, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining today's webinar, Take a Deep Breath. My name is Reggie Hammond, and I am the Senior Manager for Commercial and Clinical Education at Advanced Sterilization Products. And it is my pleasure to get to introduce today's webinar. For the next 45 minutes or so, we will be providing insights into airway devices and their processing, and hope you will all walk away with a few key takeaways that you can then put into practice. We will have a Q&A session following the live presentation, so please feel free to ask your questions in the chat, and at the end, we will answer as many of those questions as we have time for. Today's host is Janet Moran, and as you may have seen from Janet's bio, she is a senior clinical education consultant for advanced sterilization products. Janet provides education and consultative services to the operating room, sterile processing, endoscopy, and infection prevention departments. She has over 20 years of experience in perioperative services, working in a variety of roles, and has presented at both local and national seminars. She serves on the board for the Orange County Association of Perioperative Nurses, and is also a member of ISHM and SGNA. We are very much looking forward to spending this time with you. And so without further delay, Janet, I'll hand it over to you to get started. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Today's Welcome. presentation, Take a Deep Breath, Reprocessing of Laryngoscopes and Bronchoscopes. Our objectives for this presentation are define the terms of laryngoscopes and bronchoscopes, identify when and why airway devices are utilized, review common microorganisms associated with airway devices, discuss reprocessing options for airway devices, and discuss the barriers to properly reprocessing airway devices. When we talk about airway devices, you might think about COVID-19, ICUs, and respirators. But while airway devices can assist with life-saving measures, they are used for a variety of procedures in assisting with the diagnosis, treatment, and maintenance of airways. The larynx, commonly called the voice box, is the portion of the respiratory tract containing the vocal cords. 
It is between the pharynx and the trachea. It's about two inches long and its cartilage forms the Adam's apple. What's a laryngoscope? A laryngoscope is a common airway device that is used for examining the larynx. It can be used for inserting an endotracheal tube. The photo on the slide is an example of a rigid laryngoscope handle and blade. I can tell you when I first started in the OR, the cleaning of these devices was dependent on the anesthesiologist's direction. We'll talk a little bit more about reprocessing in a few minutes. There are both rigid and flexible laryngoscopes, which is used is dependent on physician preference and procedure. Laryngoscopy is an examination of the larynx, which is part of the throat using a laryngoscope. As mentioned, there are rigid and flexible laryngoscopes. The rigid laryngoscope is a telescope and the flexible or the black material scopes that contain lots of fiber optic strands and are made up of different materials and epoxy or glues. Depending on the materials used will determine whether a rigid or flexible scope can hold up to high level disinfection or sterilization methods. An indirect laryngoscopy is the simplest procedure. If you remember saying ah as a child when the doctor placed a tongue blade to hold down your tongue and inspected the back of your throat, that is when an indirect laryngoscope might be used. Fiber optic laryngoscopy, also known as nasal laryngoscopy, is the most common way the vocal cord or larynx is observed. It can be passed through either the mouth or the nose. A fiber optic laryngoscope or nasal laryngoscope often has no channels, so cleaning and disinfecting or high level disinfecting or sterilization is surface related, therefore simplified, versus some of those other types of flexible scopes that are more complex like GI scopes. Direct laryngoscopy using either a rigid or flexible scope might be used for removal of a foreign body, for example, a stuck chicken or fish bone. This can be considered a medical emergency if there is an irritation of the epiglottis since swelling can lead to airway obstruction. And I remember many a night in the OR being on call and being uh, called in for these types of emergent cases. Direct laryngoscopy can also be used to take a biopsy. Laryngoscopes are used to visualize your voice box or larynx. Bronchoscopes are used to visualize the bronchus or bronchi bronchioles of the lung. A bronchoscope is a thin, flexible instrument with a lighted viewing tube that is used to visualize the air passages to the lungs. It's more complex than a laryngoscope, but less complex than a GI scope. Typically, flexible bronchoscopes are considered single channel with an opening for the suction channel and biopsy channel. The two come together as a Y off of the control head or the operating portion of the scope. We see the control head of the bronchoscope in the photo. It is inserted through the nose or mouth or tracheostomy. Bronchoscopy is used to visualize the inside of the airways for either diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. So let's just take a quick review of the procedure. Patients uh, for rigid bronchoscopy. The patient's put in a subine position. The rigid bronchoscope is introduced. Um, the epiglottis is gently lifted so the larynx and vocal cords can be seen. The bronchoscope is passed through the vocal cords entering the trachea. The bronchoscope is gently advanced towards the carina and systematically inserted into the main stem bronchus. Telescopes may then be inserted into the rigid bronchoscope to visualize the distal segments. Once the preliminary examination is completed, purpose of the procedure needs to be addressed, whether that's dilation, extraction of foreign bodies, or maybe a laser ablation. When we look at the photo, what we see here are the sheaths to the left, so the sheaths that are used. We see the telescope to the right, so that's what they use to visualize through. And then in the middle, the white piece that covers the telescope is actually a protective sheath for transport.
The procedure for a flexible bronchoscopy varies a bit depending on what the objective is. Therefore, it can be as quick as 15 minutes or as long as an hour. The bronchoscope is inserted through the mouth or the throat and is advanced down the back of the throat, through the vocal cords, and into the bronchus of the lungs. Why is a bronchoscopy done? Some of the reasons a bronchoscopy is done is to take biopsy, treat infections, remove blockages, or address bleeding within the area. So let's test your knowledge on this portion of the presentation. Bronchoscopes are medical devices used as a diagnostic tool to determine A, infection and disease of the lung, i.e. cancer, B, airway blockage, atelectasis, and bleeding, C, noisy breathing and abnormal airways and lung transplant, or D, all of the above. D, all of the above. Now that we know what laryngoscopes and bronchoscopes are and why they're used, let's move on to, to the impact reprocessing of these devices can have on patients' lives. Improper reprocessing of these devices in the past has caused news headlines and have influenced current practice for reprocessing. Let's take a look at one of these headlines and what happened. In 2007, an outbreak of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in an acute care hospital was related to rigid laryngoscopes used to intubate neonates, which were subjected to cleaning, but no further reprocessing. And it's my understanding what happened was that originally they were being reprocessed in SPD, but SPD was losing them. And so respiratory took ownership of them again. And the way they were cleaning them, I, I believe, was with just some alcohol. So they weren't high-level disinfecting them or sterilizing them. Five babies were affected. The event shut down the hospital's neonatal ICU, and unfortunately, a few of the babies lost their lives. This event and others changed the recommendation for reprocessing laryngoscope blades and handles by the California Department of Health and then eventually throughout many other states in the country. Yes, some of these events were a long time ago, but are significant and, rele uh, and relevant to our practice today. We're going to take a closer look at a study that was done in 2018, a little later in the presentation. The two most common organisms that cause infection related to bronchoscopes are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can be from either an endogenous, meaning within the patient themselves, or exogenous, meaning from an outside source. An example of an endogenous infection is Pseudomonas aeruginosa resulting from aspiration of secretions in a sedated patient during a flexible bronchoscope. An example of an exogenous preventable infection during bronchoscopy is Pseudomonas and Mycobacterium being transmitted from one patient to another by a contaminated endoscope or accessories. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can have very serious complications, including septicemia and death. This is true for another opportunistic organism Serratia marcescens. Rutala and Weber, and I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Rutala, but Dr. Rutala is a famous uh, epidemiologist out of North Carolina, world renowned. And he and Weber wrote a book on uh, disinfection and sterilization in 2008, and it's still on the CDC website. Well, in 2008, they identified the different microorganisms and resistance to the different methods of reprocessing. Resistance determined the guidance for where the devices fell. For example, low or medium level disinfection, high level disinfection, or sterilization. As we move up the line on the left, from most susceptible to most resistant, we see lipid or medium sized viruses, herpes or coronavirus, are the easiest to destroy. Following up the scale of resistance are vegetated bacteria, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, fungi, 
such as aspergillus, non-lipid or smallest viruses, such as polio, mycobacterium, we know it as TB, coccidia or cryptosporidium, and bacterial spores. Bacillus atrophius is an example. Sterilization kills bacterial spores. High-level disinfection kills everything but some bacterial spores. At the very top, you'll see prions, the most resistant. Prions associated with crutchfeldt jakob or CJD, are complex and most difficult to kill. Reprocessing guidance, as outlined by the World Health Organization, WHO, should be followed when instruments are used on a patient suspected of having CJD. And that could be another topic on its own. In 2015, the FDA estimated 500,000 patients receiving bronchoscopes for diagnosis of conditions affecting the airways and lungs. I suspect that number has gone up in 2020, especially with all the respiratory sy symptoms associated with COVID-19. The FDA also identified two factors that can contribute to infections associated with bronchoscopes. One, not meticulously following manufacturer's instructions for use, and two, using devices that are damaged. ORs, and I know this from working in them, are notorious for having old bronchoscopes and that maybe they haven't used for a very long time. But remember, just because you haven't used them doesn't mean that they're still functional. So it's always something that you wanna check out to make sure that the integrity of the material is still good. Also in 2015, the FDA posted a safety communication. Infections associated, associated with reprocessed flexible bronchoscopes and identified failure to meticulously follow manufacturer's instructions for use for reprocessing as a recurrent theme. The missteps included, one, lack of pre-cleaning, also known as point-of-use cleaning, two, failure to perform thorough cleaning, three, failure to brush or flush channels, four, use of expired detergent or high-level disinfectant, five, insufficient flushing, rinsing, or drying. Why might these steps occur, these missteps occur? possibly because of lack of education, um, staff's perception of the risk being low for transmitting those microorganisms, inadequate resources. Are there enough people? Do they have the right tools? Lack of supervision, lack of maintenance on the device. Remember, these devices are black and fairly complex. Don't assume just because a bronchoscope is working, it's safe for use. There are many variables that can affect a bronchoscope's integrity. What else can affect the ability for a device to transmit disease? Biofilm. Biofilm is an assemblage of microbial cells that is ir irreversibly attached to a surface and in a matrix of different substances. When microorganisms form biofilm, they are able to survive under conditions of drying, chemical, and antibiotic exposure. Plaque on your teeth is an example of a biofilm. And this is why you go to the dental hygienist twice a year. If the biofilm's not removed, you get gum disease and possibly even an infection. The best way to deal with biofilm is to prevent it from occurring. This can be accomplished by proper reprocessing and maintenance of flexible endoscopes. Let's test your knowledge for this portion of the presentation. Name two factors that may help explain infections by bronchoscopes. A, personal competency in cleaning the device. B, not having the resources to properly process the device. C, not following the manufacturer of the device IFU. D, not performing proper maintenance on the device. Or E, all of the above. 
Yes, all are the correct answers. There are many variables that can impact infections caused by contaminated bronchoscopes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Spalding, but Spalding was a physician who in the 60s identified how devices should be reprocessed. Um, and he decided this based on how the risk of infection uh, that it may cause. Spalding placed devices into three categories, critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. Critical devices are those devices that enter tissue or body cavities. An example is a cholecystoscope or biopsy forcep. Sterilization is the minimum that these devices can be used for reprocessing. Semi-critical devices are those devices that come in contact with the mucous membranes. An example is a flexible endoscope. High-level disinfection is the minimum method for reprocessing these devices. However, depending on the device, it may also be, also be validated for sterilization. Non-critical devices are those that come into contact with intact skin. A blood pressure cuff is an example of a non-critical device that requires a minimum of low or intermediate disinfection. So who makes the decision on how we process flexible scopes? HICPAC is a federal advisory committee who provides guidance to the CDC and the Secretary of Health and Human Resources, or Human Services. The committee's focus is on practice and strategies for surveillance, prevention, and control of healthcare-associated infections, known as HAIs, antibiotic resistance, and related events in the United States. The organizations and agencies listed here were tasked in 2015 to provide guidance on ways to improve facility level training in ensuring competency for reprocessing endoscopes. And we see there's a good representation from infection control to professional organizations such as AORN, um, Amy, um, the FDA, and also the Joint Commission. In addition, HICPAC provides a toolkit of sample documents to accompany its guidance. Professional organizations, for example, ARN, sit on task forces and committees for various organizations and agencies, but also provide individual guidelines for clinical practice. As it relates to semi-critical devices, ARN has a guideline stating, reusable semi-critical items that are manufacturer validated for sterilization should be sterilized if possible. Because ARN uses scientific research to base the guidelines, this particular one has been identified as moderate evidence to support it. According to Rotala and Weber, most infections associated with reprocessing of medical or surgical instruments involve high-level disinfection of semi-critical devices. Going back to Spalding's classification, is it time to change it? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the chat room. Although not all states require high-level disinfection or sterilization of handles, there have been reports of potentially infectious agents being left on ready-for-use handles, including blood, staph aureus, and a cyanobacter. Some things to take note of. If both the laryngoscope blade and handle are sterilized, they need to be checked for function prior to use. There's nothing worse than being part of an intubation and finding out that the light's not working on the laryngoscope blade. So uh, it's really, really important. Even if a protective sheath is used, laryngoscope blades and handles should be sterilized or high-level disinfected. The Joint Commission states after high-level disinfection or sterilization, the laryngoscope blades and handles must be packaged in a way that prevents recontamination. Now to that study I mentioned earlier. In 2018, Osted et al. published a study that evaluated the effectiveness of bronchoscope reprocessing. The study background identified that pathogen transmission occurred even when reprocessing policies, which included cleaning 
and high-level disinfection were followed. This prospective study was multi-site, involved examination of 24 clinically used bronchoscopes, used a systematic approach with direct observation, used visual inspection, which included lighted magnification in a boroscope, and ATP testing to detect contamination. So what were the results? Well, quite frankly, the results were startling. 100% of the scopes had residual contamination after cleaning. Microbial growth was found in 14 or 58% of fully reprocessed bronchoscopes. Irregularities such as retained fluid, brown, red, or oily residue, scratches, damage insertion tubes, distal ends, and debris and channels were found. In addition, the study found substandard reprocessing at two of the three sites they visited. The conclusion was that contaminated bronchoscopes were at all sites. Inadequate reprocessing practices may have contributed. Even when guidelines are followed, high-level disinfection was not effective. Ofsted's recommendation is to shift towards sterilization of bronchoscopes. The steps to reprocessing any flexible endoscope are complex, but essential. Let's walk through what should be done each and every time. Pre-cleaning or point of use cleaning needs to be performed immediately following the use of the scope, wherever that occurs. When transporting the scope, use a container that is leak proof and puncture resistant. Label the transport card or container as a biohazard. Leak test scopes in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions for use. If the scope fails the leak test, remove it from service. Manual cleaning is the most critical step. Always use a freshly prepared cleaning solution. Use the cleaning solution in the correct concentration, temperature, and designated time. Cleaning solution may adhere to the scope if you use too much, sort of like uh, when you go to the restroom and you wash your hands and you leave a little soap on it, and then you go to touch a doorknob and the stickiness. Same thing happens with scopes if you use too much of a cleaning solution. If you use too little, then it's not effective. Use a clean brush for each scope cleaning and use the appropriate size for the channel being clean. Rinse and flush the channels meticulously. After manual cleaning, visually inspect the scope and accessories for cleanliness, missing parts, lens clarity, integrity, moisture, and function. All of these steps should take place prior to either high-level disinfecting or sterilizing the device. Always reference the manufacturer's instructions for use for determining in which modality the scope can be reprocessed. Following high-level disinfection, whether manual or, aut or automated, flush the channels with 70 to 90% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol again following the manufacturer of the scope's instructions for use. Studies have supported the use of alcohol following by drying as a method to prevent microbial growth in a high-level disinfected endoscope. There is not a consensus on length of time a flexible endoscope can be stored after high-level disinfection and would be dependent on a risk assessment and the professional guideline the facility decides to follow. It is recommended, however, that the scopes do not touch the floor of the cabinet and that they never be stored in the original shipment case. Always wear gloves when handling clean scopes. Have a method in place for identifying whether the scope has been reprocessed and is safe for patient use. Documentation is essential for quality assurance and patient tracking. HICPAC has an audit tool on the CDC website that outlines what should be included. It includes date and time, the identification of the endoscope and accessories, method of verification of cleaning and results of the cleaning verification test, 
number of identifier of the reprocessor, reprocessor or sterilizer, so the AER is sterilizer. Results of efficacy testing, that's uh, checking your solution with a test strip. Identification of persons doing the reprocessing, who put it in, who took it out. Lot number of the reprocessing solutions. Disposition of defective items or equipment. Maintenance of water systems. So are you keeping a log sheet on uh, maintenance of your wall filters or your internal filters on an AER? Endoscopes and endoscope accessories. Um, are you keeping a log as to what you have in inventory, what's gone out for repair? Uh, and also on uh, processing equipment. So when your PMs are due, you should be keeping track of that as well on, on the AERs. This information is available to anyone who goes on to the uh, CDC website. So that audit tool I just mentioned. Are you manually high-level disinfecting? One of the challenges with manually reprocessing is there are a few, if any, automated steps. And so depending on who is doing it and the supplies they have at their disposal could determine the outcome in getting either a high-level disinfected scope or a contaminated one. Let's review some general information as well as considerations. Any high-level disinfectant used for manually reprocessing a device must have FDA approval. It must be effective against pathogens with the exception of some bacterial spores. If it is a chemical sterilant, it must pass the AOAC sporocidal test. Some high-level disinfectants may be considered a chemical sterilant after an extended period of soaking time. The high-level disinfectant or chemical sterilant must be approved to be used as a manual process. Considerations of whether you want to manually reprocess laryngoscopes or bronchoscopes are the following. Number of devices and the complexity. For example, does the device have channels, which makes it much more difficult, much more challenging to reprocess manually? Do you have a way to monitor the time and temperature of the high-level disinfectant? How is the high-level disinfectant going to be tested for efficacy? Will test strips be used? Will the rinsing of the device be done properly? Is there space and setup to do it? Manual documentation will need to be performed. Can you capture and ensure that it is done correctly each and every time? Anytime we can automate the process, decision-making or subjectivity gets removed. The same general information applies to an automated process as it does a manual process. The considerations are volume of scopes that need to be processed. Is there a location that can be dedicated to the task? Do you want a single shot high level disinfectant or do you want a reusable one that expires with time or efficacy? Does the system allow for minimum contact points ensuring the high level disinfectant reaches all surfaces? Are test strips needed to check the efficacy of the high-level disinfectant prior to each use? Are there quality control checks to ensure the test strips are performing correctly? Is the system a closed system for vapor control and therefore less staff exposure? What needed documentation is being captured on the printout? Is there a self-disinfect cycle, either thermal or chemical? available to prevent any biofilm formation of the internal components of the AER. Terminal sterilization using low temperature hydrogen peroxide provides the greatest number of quality monitors. These quality monitors are physical, chemical, and biological. The physical is the printout that lets you know the sterilizer parameters have been met and the cycle has completed. The chemical is the internal or external indicator that lets you know the sterilant has reached that indicator. The biological indicator is the closest thing you can use to confirm sterilization because of the destruction of spores. Terminal sterilization provides a packaged product that can go on the shelf for later use, or you can use it immediately. Terminal sterilization provides a sterility assurance of 10 to the minus six, meaning that there's a chance in a million that a microorganism has survived. However, 
there are some considerations. Isn't the device validated by the manufacturer to be terminally sterilized using a low temperature system? Is there dedicated space to clean, dry, and package the devices? Do you have storage space? How will the doc documentation be done? Will it be manual or automated using an instrument tracking system or other automated system? What are your thoughts about these three options in, regarding to, in regards to reprocessing the orange scopes, bronchoscopes? I'd love to hear your opinion in the chat room. So let's test your knowledge. Sterilization provides the greatest assurance that an item is safe to use on a patient. Yes, sterilization does provide the greatest assurance that an item is safe to use on a patient. In conclusion, we have learned what laryngoscopes and bronchoscopes are, how they are used, and the challenges that are presented when reprocessing these devices. Inadequate reprocessing, as well as other variables, increases the risk of infection to patients. There are many things that can be done. For example, following the manufacturer's instructions for use when reprocessing laryngoscopes and bronchoscopes to strive for best practice, and of course, patient safety. Questions? We'll take questions now. Thank you, Janet. Uh, so we do have some questions in the chat, and um, I guess we'll start with um, one of the questions was asking, how do others sterilize laryngoscope handles? So Janet, knowing that you see this a lot as you're out visiting different um, accounts, uh, please share yeah, your thoughts. So it really depends on the manufacturer of the laryngoscope blade and handles, and of course their instructions for use. Um, I do understand that there is at least one manufacturer out there that allows you to leave the batteries in, but in general, um, if they're able to be sterilized in a low temperature system, the batteries are removed and then uh, reinserted after the process. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question was asking or just making the statement that it's hard to get the scopes dry enough to go through, uh, you know, a low temp system. Again, I don't know if you have any thoughts that you can share on that. Yeah, I think we've made a lot of progress along uh, that line in the fact that <clears throat> we can use instrument air. And then there is some other devices that will allow you to blow air through the channels to assist with drying. I don't want to mention uh, product names, but there are some other options uh, now that where you don't actually have to use a tank of air or be connected to a central uh, point, uh, central point where you can get instrument air. So, okay, thank you, Janet. And and you touched on this already, but another question came up: Can all laryngoscope handles be sterilized using low temp sterilization? No. So it really depends on the manufacturer of the, the laryngoscope blade and handle as to whether they can be sterilized using low temperature. And as far as uh, requirements for those laryngoscope blades and, uh, and handles to be uh, high level disinfected, as far as the blades, I believe it's, it's standard for those to at least be high level disinfected for the handles. I believe it can be a little variable depending on where you are in the country. Meaning using low, uh, a low level disinfectant versus a high level disinfectant or sterilization. So if a, a customer was using um, an AER to process bronchoscopes, um, one of the questions also came up um, around the use of AERs, is it okay to top off the high level disinfectant in an AER? Again, for, for topping off, you really wanna look at the high level disinfectant, uh, the manufacturer of the high level disinfectant and what their guidance or instructions for use are in relation to that. 
Um, according to Amy, standard 91, it's unacceptable to top off the basin of a HLD or AER reservoir containing the reusable HLD solution unless the unless there are instructions specific to that from the HLD manufacturer. Um, and just, just to um, add on to that, topping off does not extend the life of the solution. So even if the test strip passes, its life is not extended by topping it off. <clears throat> True, thank you. And I think just the very last question that was posed, uh, does the age of a bronchoscope affect the ability to clean and high level disinfect that scope? Yeah, I would assume so. And I, I did kind of mention that on, that, on, on the webinar. However, um, in thinking back with Ofsted's study, um, in her particular study from 2018, there didn't, appear to be an association between bronchoscope age um, or a study site uh, in her findings of, you know, the discoloration and scratches and debris. So um, that is somewhat debated, but I think in my experience in the OR and looking back at how old uh, some of the bronchoscopes are that are still in use, one of the challenges is you know, just being up to date with the materials that they're made of so that you do have options in reprocessing. Yeah, very true. And I think the last question that was asked was really not clinical in nature, but um, asking if a copy of the slides would be sent after the presentation. And I believe this presentation will get loaded up onto our website for on-demand viewing and usage. But I will verify that and um, we'll make sure that we let all the attendees know when and if it's available. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, Janet, want to thank you for this great presentation. Hopefully everyone learned a lot. And as I said, uh, some key takeaways that you'll be able to take back with you um, and, and put into use. Um, and um, hopefully help elevate your practice. So have a great afternoon, everybody, and thank you once again for joining ASPs. Take a deep breath. Thank you, Reggie. Thanks, everyone.